Hello, can everyone hear me? I'm sorry to interrupt your eating, but I have a really important reason for this interruption. My name's Beverly Kingston, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence at CU Boulder. That's the center that Del, Dr. Dell Elliott founded in 1992, and our center is about bridging the gap between research and practice, and I have the great really great honor and priv privilege of spending a few minutes to honor the incredibly great work of Sharon and Dell. So I'm going to do that. I have a few th different things to say. So I first heard Dell speak about blueprints in the fall of 1998 at an Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency and Prevention conference in Washington, D.C., and hearing Dell speak at that conference changed my life. I was working at that time in the Gulfton neighborhood in southwest Houston, and that neighborhood was the zip code with the highest juvenile crime rate in Harris County, and we were implementing communities that care in that community, and we were working on our community action plan and really struggling to figure out which programs we should be selecting. We didn't know how to discern those programs. And when I learned about blueprints, um, and that we didn't know what were effective programs at that time in 1998, when I heard about blueprints, I knew it was the answer that we were looking for. for. Blueprints was that missing piece. At that time, I also was applying to graduate schools all around the country for, in sociology. Dell is a sociologist. <laughs> And I quickly, once I learned about the center, added CU Boulder to, to my list of schools. And I knew I wanted to go there most of all. And I knew I wanted to help out in the work at the center any way that I possibly could. Um, I wanted to help to bridge that huge gap that we were seeing at the community level um, between research and practice. So recently, Carl Hill, who's our new program director that you got introduced to yesterday, reminded us that in 1980, there was a, a research out or a, a review of the literature that said nothing works to prevent violence. Today, that is not the case. Today, there are 81 programs on the Blueprints list. Today, we can say we know what works and that if we put the, these programs into place, we can reduce violence and other problem behaviors by 20 to 30 percent. Blueprints has led the evidence-based program movement. And behind this movement, working steadfastly with courage, dedication, and commitment are Sharon Mihalik and Dr. Del Elliott. Their work has changed the world. They never compromise the highest scientific research standards in decisions big and small. I love Sharon's words from an email that I was copied on last week. She wrote, this level of dedication to promoting only what we can definitively demonstrate by evaluation may seem nitpicky to some, but we have chosen science as our ultimate standard of evidence. This means sometimes programs come off the blueprints list. This means that there are a lot of good programs out there that don't yet make it on the list. This means People get mad at us sometimes. But Dell and Sharon stay true to the science, no matter what, no matter what. The other thing about the center, and I've been there now, well, I, I started grad school in 1999. Dell was my dissertation advisor, and I finished in 2005. And I came back as director in 2012. So I have quite a long history with the center. And at the center, what, what's on the slide you can see ab above is that we're a family. Um, the Center and Blueprints, it, it's a family. That is our culture. And it's a family that's built on, on these high standards of excellence, but also it's built on a foundation of generosity, kindness, and here's the part. We'll see if I cry this time, is that I have to say is, and love. 
It's built on love. And being, when I walked into the, to the Blueprints conference yesterday, I felt like I was at a family reunion. And some of you may feel like we don't see each other all the time. Some of you may be new, but I, I wonder if there are many of you that also feel that, like you're coming back to the family reunion. And, you know, I have my Blueprint story, and I probably could talk about it for like five hours. But I know each of you also may also have a Blueprint story or some words of thanks that you may want to write to Dell and Sharon. And we did put some cards on the table. You don't have to do this right now, but if you did want to take a minute, you can, you can leave the cards on the table, or we also have a basket at the registration desk if you want to put your cards there. So as I was, I knew I was going to get to do this and come up here, and I was like, how in the world do I do justice to speaking about how wonderful Dell and Sharon are and what their great work has been? And, so I was like, how do you pay tribute to this? And about a week and a half ago in the shower, it kind of came to me. <laughs> so we'll see how I do with it. But I was working on these remarks, and you know, some other stuff came to me that I'm not going to say out loud. <laughs> but this is what did come. And I started to see this image. Um, and it was an image. Let's see if it comes. Yeah. It was an image of a tree. I saw a big tree that represented Dell and Sharon and where they have taken us. And then I started to see this image of many trees, um, of many trees standing with their tree. And I thought that that image represented us growing their work. And I really thought that the best way we can honor Dell and Sharon and their incredible work is to grow it. We must grow the big tree that they have planted into the biggest forest. Please join me in honoring and thanking Sharon and Dell for their tremendous work. Thank you. The other thing that I just wanted to do, I wanted to launch them with, I don't know, I was thinking a poem, but what really came to me was a blessing. And one of my favorite, favorite poets, philosopher, 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 poet is John O'Donohue. So some of you may know of his work. And he just has these beautiful blessings that, and he has a blessing for retirement. So in Carl, Where's Carl? Carl, I was, Carl sends poetry to us every week, and so I said, Carl, do you have any poems? And for both of us, we came to this as being what we want to give to you as our blessing for your retirement. So it's called For Retirement by John O'Donohue. This is where your life has arrived. After all the years of effort and toil, look back with graciousness and thanks on all your great and quiet achievements. You stand on the shore of new invitation to open your life to what is left undone. Let your heart enjoy a different rhythm. When drawn to the wonder of other horizons, have the courage for a new approach to time. Allow it to slow until you find freedom, to draw alongside the mystery you hold and befriend your own beauty of soul. Now is the time to enjoy your heart's desire, to live the dreams you've waited for, to awaken the depths beyond your work, and enter into your infinite source. Congratulations, and thank you from my deepest place. <laughs> Love you guys. OK. <laughs> OK, so now I'm going to shift a little bit to academic Beverly, <laughs> slightly, and, and that is, um, I get to introduce Dell's talk. And Dell is going to talk to us today in his keynote talk, and 
I debated if I, I asked him if I could say this may be his final keynote talk, but I've been coming to Dell's retirement party since around 2004. So I, <laughs> I don't want to say, because we want to keep the stage open for him always, but it could be the last, his final talk, and it might not be. <laughs> so let's just say that. But no matter what, it's going to be special. And he's going to talk to us today about the challenges facing blueprints going forward, which is a really, really important message. And I want to just tell you some, this would take, again, to your whole talk for me to give your credentials and your background, but there's a few things I want to say about Dell. Dell is a distinguished professor emeritus which is the highest honor at CU. There's only one of 19 currently retired professors at the university with this status. He has conducted numerous important studies, the National Youth Survey, the Denver Youth Survey, the Denver Neighborhood Study. He has written many books. Um, one of the books that was most influential for me, he was working on it while I was doing my dissertation, is Good Kids from Bad Neighborhoods. Most recently, he published a book, a textbook called The Prevention of Crime, which he co-authored with Abby Fagan, who's here and has been presenting with Dell today. As he mentioned this morning, he's also the scientific editor of the Surgeon General's Report on Youth Violence. I, that was published in 2001. It's, I don't know, it's kind of like a Bible, in a way, of violence prevention. And so many of the recommendations and the knowledge in that report are still very, very rele relevant. Just a couple other things that Dell, in his, he, he's so rigorous about the science, but also the theory. Everything that Dell stands for is grounded in both, and I just love that. And the other piece is that he didn't just stay in academia. He took what he learned from research and said it's not getting out there, and he put it into practice in building the center and in the work that he's doing with blueprints. So he's committed his life to putting what he's learned from research, from putting the best science into practice. So I'm thrilled, really thrilled, to introduce my mentor and hero, Dr. Delbert Elliott. Thank you, Beverly. It, it is true that, um, that I have retired before. <laughs> this is um, technically, I guess, my third retirement. But in my defense, at each one, I have cut back. So the first retirement was a genuine one. But uh, the person that we hired to take over my position left. And I was asked to come back again and fill in temporarily. That temporarily extended out for a longer period of time. Uh, then I had a second retirement, and I came back and um, worked from instead of half time down to a third time. So I'm at the point where I haven't any further to go without going to zero. So that's where we are. I thought what I would like to do was to talk about the origins of blueprints, where we've come, and how I see the future. Um, blueprints started really as a result of great frustration that I felt having the contract from the state of Colorado to do the evaluation of all of the, the burn funds coming into the state that were then allocated to delinquency, um, dropout and drug uh, prevention programs that were funded by the state. Um, that experience was a very difficult one. Um, at that point, the state was giving one-year contracts for programs of those three types. And that one-year one grant required them to set up their program, staff it, begin to, uh, to deliver the intervention that they described, to set up a data collection system, to start collecting data, to get enough data that you could do an evaluation so that nine months after the beginning of that project, you could deliver a report that was required for continuing funding. 
And I, I looked at that and thought, well, how in the world is it possible for people getting that kind of a grant situation to function? The other part that was so disturbing to me was the kinds of things that were being funded. And to be quite honest and frank about it, a significant part of what was funded was simple political patronage. The other part involved some fairly good programs, potentially, if they could have funding over a sustained period of time. Um, but there were a lot of things that were funded for which I had absolutely no hope of their having any significant effect on those programs, programs or those problems uh, they, that they were attempting uh, to deliver. As a result of that, my first response was to be, I guess, a hostile at, uh, at the process that was going on. The committee that made these assignments was a committee that was half of which was appointed by the governor, the other half was appointed by the president of the Senate. So you can see right off that the political influence in that particular case was a very significant one. But I decided, after thinking about it, that the problem really wasn't there. The problem was that they had no good information. They had no place to go where they could look at some information that would give them some ideas about what things did work and what things didn't work. And it was that realization that there was, in fact, no place that this committee, even with its political background, could go to get that kind of information. So that led essentially to my decision that we needed to be able to provide good information on what works and make it available to those who are in the position to make key decisions about what gets funded. And to provide hope and some reasonable expectation to families and children in our state that the programs that they were often mandated into had some promise of providing some positive effect on their lives. So that, that's how Blueprint started. The original contract that we got to start the, the work was one which came from the uh, Division of Criminal Justice in the state of Colorado. Um, and the director of that, uh, that program in the state was Bill Woodward. Um, and Bill and I talked at length about how we could develop a registry type situation. Um, and Bill was very generous and provided some initial support. Uh, Bill is now working here uh, in the center. Uh, he's, he's a longtime uh, scholar and researcher now in our program. Uh, but we got additional funding from CDC, um, and we got funding from the state of Pennsylvania on the Crime and Delinquency Commission in, in the state of Pennsylvania. You can see that later on, we continue to get funding from the Metropolitan Life Foundation, OJJDP, Annie E. Casey Foundation, and currently the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. And we went from originally 10 model programs to currently 81 programs and 60, excuse me, 66 promising, 13 model, and, and two, excuse, two model plus. Uh, it's my understanding we also have another model program in the works. We're waiting to finish the readiness evaluation of that program, so we actually are looking at having 16 model and model plus programs. And I hope you remember that our position is that promising programs are really not ready to go to scale. That is, the evidence for them is not sufficient to go to scale. So that we're looking at model and model plus programs, 16 programs that we propose could be taken to scale and being implemented in a national initiative with great promise that those programs would have a significant effect uh, on the outcomes that they are addressing. One of the first challenges that I think we face is the limited use of registries. The Bridge Band Group did a, a survey of several years ago talking to key decision makers about their use of the registries. Did they know of the registries? When they, did they go to the registries and consult them when they were thinking about looking for new programs? And the really discouraging thing out of that survey 
was the key decision makers weren't using our registries. Not just blueprints. They weren't using crimesolutions.gov. They weren't using NREP. They weren't using child trends. They weren't using any of the available registries at any significant level. And that was really discouraging. I mean, all of the work that we do, evaluating programs, putting them up, describing them, and yet there was evidence that key decision makers weren't using that information. So this is what they want, according to that survey. They want information on the full set of available programs. It turns out that when they go to the registry, they were typically going to look for a specific program they already decided they were going to implement, or that they knew about and wanted to see how that program was rated on the registry. That's something which we were not doing. We only list those programs that are promising or model, model plus programs. We have 1,400 plus programs in our database that we know about, that we've looked at, but we aren't putting that other information up and it's available. They wanted more information on program impact. They wanted information on implementation, how to implement it, what the costs for implementation were, what the unit based costs were, what the resources are that are required in order to be able to this implement this program. They wanted guidance on selecting programs and planning for the implementation of a program should they choose to implement one. They wanted information on policies, management decisions, and best practices. And they wanted a friendly navigation and readily understood ratings. The ratings are quite different from one registry to another. It was very confusing to them. I understand that. It would be confusing. And they found some of the registries very difficult to navigate. So our first challenge is to address those issues. And so I think I wanted to give you a real quick update uh, on the uh, website for Blueprints. And we have a new website that will be coming up uh, shortly. But currently, we now provide rating practices uh, on pra ratings on practices and on policies as well as programs as we've extended our, our consideration and evaluation of the evidence to these kinds of interventions as well as programs. Our blueprint programs are now including adult programs, at least in the juvenile justice area, in response to the Arnold Foundation's interest in knowing what kinds of programs, practices, and policies are effective in working with adults. All programs now that are in the database are being rated on a continuum of evidence classification. So we now will provide some information on every program in that database. Uh, that at least will allow people to get on the database, look up some program that they're interested in, and if it's not a model or a promising program, they can see how we rated it on that rating system. And I'll mention that system uh, here in a moment. Oh, well, it's there. So the database classification now includes model, model plus, promising, ineffective, harmful, inconclusive, insufficient evidence. So every program is going to be rated into one of those categories. And just, just to be sure that we're together, when we talk about a program being ineffective or being harmful, we use the same standard that we would use to classify a program as being a promising program. It takes as good of evidence to say something doesn't work as to say that something does work. And we've expanded the information available for each and I use the term experimentally proven programs on the website to facilitate better informed decision making for the key decision makers. So here's a quick rundown now on what that database looks like with respect to the fact sheets that are available on uh, promising and model programs. The program name and description, the developmental behavioral outcomes, we list the risk and protective factors that a program is targeting in their intervention, and we also indicate whether or not the evaluation evidence supports the fact that those risk and protective factors were changed, were affected, influenced by that intervention. Uh, that's a critical piece of information because in many cases, as I think 
uh, Jim Mercy mentioned, the risk factors that we're talking about that were targeted for change are outcome variables, outcome uh, that, that other people are interested in. So that provides good information to developers to know that this is an intervention which was successful in changing that risk or protective factor. We provide contact information and program support information. We identify the target population. It's very critical that we, we claim that the effects of this program have been demonstrated only with respect to the targeted populations which are identified uh, on our fact sheets for that program. And then the program rating and the effect size are available, the operating domains, individual family school, the logic theory that's behind this intervention is listed, program costs, cost benefit information, a funding overview, funding strategies are available to help uh, secure funding if uh, somebody decides they want to implement this program, and then references uh, to the evaluation work that's been done on that program. The next challenge, it seems to me, has to do with the confusion that we have over the term evidence-based. The original meaning of that term, from my perspective at least, when we talked about an evidence-based program, we were talking about experimental evidence from rigorous trials that provided statistically, statistically significant positive results for the effects of that program. Essentially, we are saying this is evidence which provides a demonstrated causal relationship. And that is essentially the definition used by all of these agencies listed there, all of the registries that I know of have adopted essentially a minimum requirement for experimental evidence that that program is effective. Right now, we are facing a, a different interpretation of what we mean by evidence-based, that it now is seen as referring to a continuum of evidence which justifies a best evidence selection policy. And, and let me just say, I think I'm in agreement with the idea that we use the best evidence available. So we have a continuum we call an evidence-based continuum. The problem with that is that any level or type of evidence makes an intervention evidence-based. And from my perspective, it is in fact an ambiguity in the title or the name that we used for these experimentally proven programs. So the fault is ours in many respects that we used a term which didn't designate the level of evidence or type of evidence that's required before we certify a program as an effective program. So the policy tends to also assume that doing something, any level of positive evidence, is better than doing nothing. I want to argue that there are cases where doing nothing would be better. But in on average, I agree, we should be using the best evidence available and doing something is likely, if we have some evidence, to be better than doing nothing. The downside of that is that we do now know that there are a number of things which we are doing which have been implemented widely in this country on a national level which are harmful. And so we cannot just assume that doing something, some idea which seems good, is going to work or at least have no negative effect because we now know that harm is being done and we are putting children into, into situations and into conditions which we know do harm. I, I'm, I'm surprised we have not yet seen a class action suit for f mandating children to go into a scared straight program. I don't understand that. I don't know why it hasn't happened. We are putting children into programs we know do them more harm than good. So there are ethical problems, it seems to me, with requiring participation in programs with unknown effects and no intention or commitment to evaluation. Uh, it's okay, we put, pro we put kids in programs that we don't yet know what the effects of that program might be. We have reason to believe from the theoretical background and from correlational studies uh, that this program would be effective, and, and that's fine. What I want is either 
that it is a, that we know what the effects are or that we are committed to finding out what those effects are. And finally, it is unethical to put our children and our, our, our youth into programs which are known to be harmful programs. So here's the evidence-based continuum. This is widely uh, promoted. It's promoted by uh, the Justice Department. It's promoted by CDC. It's promoted uh, by many agencies. And this is typically the kind of uh, continuum of evidence on the evidence-based continuum, uh, beginning with opinion-informed kinds of information, satisfaction surveys, personal experiences, anecdotes, anecdotes um, research-informed levels, which in includes pre-post assessments or post assessments only, and, and correlational studies. Many of these correlational studies are exploratory studies. They are fishing expeditions in data and they come up with a correlational relationships between a particular kind of intervention and an outcome, that's pretty weak information because that really is hypothesis forming correlational evidence. It's not validating hypotheses or theoretical propositions. And then we do have good longitudinal research, which is hypothesis testing research, which is much better evidence. And then we have that line and experimentally proven programs, which involve the use of an experimental design study and a quality study which addresses all of the issues with respect to the internal validity of that study. Even within that level, we have major differences, but at least it's comforting to me that all of the registries require experimental evidence for the programs they list on that registry. It's unfortunate to me that most of the registries will include a study with a single quasi-experimental design and no replication and call it a model program or an effective program. Given what we know from recent studies looking at replications of experiments and the high failure rate in the replications, I am very concerned about taking any program to scale that has never been replicated. That seems to me to be a very serious issue. And it's one we face because all of the other registries, except for the Coalition for Evidence-Based Practices and the current new Arnold Foundation registry, allow for that. So I just looked at uh, the, the uh, crimesolutions.gov website, and, and over half of the programs they call effective programs involve a single quasi-experimental study. So what are our options? Well, we can work to achieve better agreement on the label evidence-based seeing it as being reserved for programs and practices or policies with experimental evidence, or we can drop the term evidence-based and substitute the term experimentally proven programs. Uh, and in case it's not obvious to you yet, it should be that I am arguing we should drop the term evidence-based when we are talking about programs that have been proven to be effective and we are recommending be taken to scale. One of the other issues that I think we face is moving, uh, elaborating on the, pro on the kinds of interventions we look at so that we're looking at more than just programs. These are this is simply a way of trying to differentiate between those types of interventions. I think that's pretty obvious to most, indivi most individuals. So we are moving into both uh, practices and policies, and that introduces a new challenge for us as we look forward uh, to the blueprints being able to certify practices and policies as being effective. This has forced us to begin looking very carefully at the use of meta-analysis in establishing whether practices and policies are effective, because this is the, the standard approach 
methodologically to address the question about that type of evidence. So we have argued for a long time that we are looking for what the predominant effect of, of a program's interventions show. So we get multiple studies done on the, in evaluating a program. They come up with different effect sizes. We, we want to be able to summarize in a significant way and careful way what the average, affected, average expected effect size would be or what the range in effect sizes might be if you were to implement that program. So we are seeing many new RCTs. I, I think um, you know, from the time that I began uh, doing research, the number of randomized control trials that were available um, were very, very rare indeed. We are seeing multiple randomized control trials coming in every year. We have programs on, uh, on our website that can have 10 or 15 randomized control trials. And that's great. We are getting increased numbers of randomized control trials and quality quasi-experimental studies. The government now is encouraging the use of randomized control trials, coming close to requiring it by saying that, the, that if you're responding to an RFP, uh, and doing an evaluation that you will be given extra credit if you use a randomized trial as compared to a quasi-experimental study. That's great information. But that leads us then to what is the best method for estimating what the average expected effect size or the range of effect sizes would be from those multiple uh, evaluations, and that puts us squarely into using meta-analyses. For practices, which is practices typically involve categories, back to that definition, uh, of programs that use a common strategy, like bullying prevention programs, family-based interventions. It's a class of programs that are considered to be using a common strategy. And in that type of a meta-analysis, there are some difficulties around that selection process. Because the way we are currently selecting programs for meta-analyses pays no attention to the logic models that are involved in the programs that are put into the class that we're looking at. That's a concern to me, because that means you've got conflicting causal explanations in that category and are trying to get an assessment of interventions which are using different logic models and different assumptions about what the causal process it might be. There's also the issue as to whether or not we should be using only RCTs or whether we should be using RCTs and quasi-experimental studies and even some non-experimental studies. There are meta-analyses which include all of those. So there's no consensus about exactly what the selection criteria ought to be. We pay no attention, incidentally, to the issue as to whether the effect that we're observing is a marginal deterrent effect compared to a treatment as usual, or whether we're comparing an absolute deterrent effect compared to doing nothing. There's a huge difference between those two kinds of evaluations. And one of the reasons why it becomes difficult to compare effect sizes because you have programs that are using one of those kinds of, of uh, effect size estimates and we, we cannot compare the effect sizes directly with the way we currently do meta-analyses. So we need to resolve a number of those issues and the Blueprint Board has taken that on we are trying to go through, we're doing some experimentation on our own, looking at what difference it makes whether you restrict the programs in that evaluation, the meta-analysis to RCTs, or whether we include quasi-experimental studies. Uh, and we're gonna, that, what that leads to is the challenge to come up with a set of criteria and rules and perhaps a new standard for rating the cluster of studies we have 
of a given strategy or even around a given single program. So I, I believe it's quite possible that the Blueprint Board may in the future, when they have 10 high quality quasi-experimental studies, determine that a meta-analysis showing positive effects that are statistically significant would warrant our calling that a model program or a model strategy. So I think we are looking carefully at guidelines, new guidelines, and conceivably changing the standards based upon the use of meta-analysis. I do, I do believe we ought to drop the term evidence-based for the programs listed on registries. I think registries ought to be listing and promoting experimentally proven programs. We have to review and develop the certification standards for practices and policies. The board is well underway at doing that. We, we have, in fact, certified some or one or two. We need to develop the capacity, the capability, and guidelines for view, reviewing meta-analysis evaluations. That's a, a problem that the board needs to wrestle with in the future and developing certification standards of evidence for meta-analysis. So I think those are the set of challenges, which as I look ahead, I'm leaving <laughs> to Carl and Pam to forge the way uh, forward uh, to deal with those particular issues. I just want to conclude by, uh, by commenting that Blueprints has from the very beginning been a team effort. And it's just been my great pleasure to be able to lead that team. And it involves many, many people that have contributed, I think, to what we've accomplished over the last 20 years, moving from 10 programs, which wouldn't all rate as model programs today, because our standards have, in fact, um, changed slightly with the availability of, of evaluations, to having 81 programs. And I, that's, that's a measure, I think, of what we've been able to accomplish uh, over approximately 20 years. I just want to express my gratitude to all of those who've helped make Blueprints become a premier registry for what works. Uh, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge Sharon. Um, we started as equal partners in this endeavor. Um, and I, I just have to say, um, I've never worked with another colleague uh, who had such talent and commitment uh, to the work that we were doing. I may be exaggerating some, but I think that if you were to ask Sharon about any program in that list of 1,400 programs that wasn't one which was dismissed initially because they had no evaluation or no control group in the evaluation, she could tell you about that program. It's a fascinating thing to me that she has a memory. Uh, don't ask me that kind of question, but you can ask Sharon. She has that capability and that skill. I also want to thank the board members. We have an advisory board, which I think is unparalleled uh, among those registries who have uh, groups of advisors, of course, uh, which help them. So I just did want to mention uh, the, the members of this board. Tom Cook, uh, Francis Gardner, Denise Gottfriedson, David Hawkins, Larry Hedges, Patrick Tolan, and Velma Murray. That is the current board. And I wish you could be at a board meeting and hear how the board <laughs> rips through <laughs> the evaluations of uh, programs that have been brought to the board as potentially model programs or model plus programs or promising programs. Unlike any other registry, we have an in-depth, detailed discussion on the part of people with the level of expertise that are involved here. We will spend an hour going over a single program with three evaluations to determine whether or not we will certify that program as a model program or a model plus program. It is a rigorous process, and I am grateful for 
the quality of people who have been willing to serve over the years uh, on our Blueprint Advisory Board. I also want to mention briefly in passing um, the secondary review team that we have. You know, our process starts with graduate research assistants that have been very well trained. They do an initial screening of all of the, uh, the, the uh, evaluation evidence that we can find to screen out those that have no control group. They go through a rigorous checklist for us looking for the, essentially the internal validity issues around the study and the design issues. But we have a group that it does the training of that team uh, and constitute a second review from what the graduate student first uh, level review. Uh, and that involves Fred Pampel, Laura Michelson, Christy Steger, uh, Phil Pendergast, this is a group of really young scholars who are exceptionally well-trained. Um, and, and it has produced for us a quality of review that comes to the board uh, that we are seeing a much higher approval rate upon the part of the board because of the quality of the reviews we're getting now with the rigorous training that we do and the quality of people we have at that second level. And I guess thirdly, I would like to thank all of you, for I feel that I personally, and I know Sharon feels this way, have been really supported and encouraged to maintain the high standards that we have maintained by all of you, your presence here. And many of you, you know, we, we've worked with individually, but I hope that we have, in turn, inspired you to develop excellent programs and to conduct high quality evaluations. I guess I would say to you that from a personal perspective, for the most part, my personal goals have been met as I look back over the last 20 years. And I believe that we're in good hands going forward with Carl and Pam, Pam and Amanda leading the way uh, into the future. So God bless you and your continued efforts to facilitate a healthy course of development for all of our children and families. The need for your expertise today is great. So I wish you Godspeed. Okay, thank you everyone. You can go on to your next sessions.